everyone. Welcome to this week's Crunch Seminar. Our first speaker today is Dr. Johannes Roysit. He is a professor of operations research at the Naval Postgraduate School. His research focuses on formulating and solving optimization problems arising in data analytics, sensor management, and reliability engineering. He was awarded a National Research Council postdoctoral fellowship in 2003, a Young Investigator Award from Air Force Office for Scientific Research in 2007, and the Barchi Prize, as well as the MOR Journal Award from the Military Operations Research Society in 2009. He obtained his PhD from UC Berkeley in 2002, and today he would be talking to us about Rockfarian functions and optimization and learning. With that, please join me in welcoming him for the presentation. You may want to share your screen, Professor. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for uh, organizing this nice seminar. Uh, I look forward to, to sharing uh, some of my thinking about uh, my optimization uh, and, uh, and learning. And uh, I'm going to uh, take a, a perspective that uh, might be a little bit unusual uh, in, in this area. And I'm anxious to see uh, what you guys think about it. So I'm going to talk about optimization from a very general point of view initially, and then we're gradually going to become more specific, uh, talking about uh, applications in several areas, including machine learning. But from, from a general point of view, an optimization problem is, uh, at least when it's in finite dimension, is about minimizing some function, I call it phi. And uh, maybe that uh, function has an argument x, and it's all about finding the best x. Uh, this function phi might even uh, have uh, values uh, infinity or even negative infinity. And in particular, infinity can play the role of something that is not really allowed. If an, if an x returns a phi of x that's infinity, uh, that's the worst thing that can happen. And that can represent constraints that you might have in your optimization model. So even though you might not see optimization, you might not see constraints in this optimization problem here, uh, they might be hidden inside the function phi. Whatever the case might be, uh, we are going to talk about uh, many issues today regarding, for instance, existence of solutions, sensitivity analysis, optimality conditions, duality is very important to develop good algorithms and insight. And we want to talk about computations. And all of those things we're going to do from the perspective of Rockefellians. So you might wonder what is a Rockefellian? Well, we have our optimization problem and a Rockefellian associated with that problem is a function that somehow helps us to analyze this problem. You might have heard about Lyapunov functions. You might have heard about Lagrangian functions. These are functions that we have in mathematics that can help us to analyze certain problems. And Rockefellians is just another one in, in this long line of functions that are helpful in some way or another. So what is a Rockefellian function? It's a bivariate function, meaning it has two inputs. I'm going to call it u and x. And what is special about this bivariate function, that if the first argument that I usually call u, if that has the value zero, the zero vector, then I'm replicating the objective function in my optimization problem of interest. This concept goes back to, at least back to 1963 when Terry Rockefeller graduated from Harvard University in mathematics, where he introduced these concepts. So it's been around for a long time and it's been a very useful tool. And I'm trying to bring that now uh, to the forefront again. Of course, Rockefeller himself didn't call these Rockefellian functions. Uh, that would have been uh, uh, slightly, uh, you know, uh, unusual as a young PhD student to have something like that in your dissertation. Uh, he called it a perturbation function. And, uh, and sometimes the by function. And um, if you look in the convex analysis book, for instance, uh, of Rockefeller from 1970, he called it the by functions. 
Okay, but whatever we call it, let's call it a Rockefellian in this uh, uh, talk, and let's see what it can do for us. So let's summarize what we have. We have uh, some sort of a optimization problem that maybe they came from machine learning. Uh, maybe they come from a resource allocation. Maybe it came from reliability engineering, wherever it came from. Let's think about that as just minimizing some phi. And then the question is, we might cook up some sort of Rockefellian function f. And that Rockefellian function then almost by definition provides a family of problems. So this Rockefeller really provides a parameterization of my optimization problem because we have this parameter vector u that can change. So we now have many problems. And of course, among those many problems is one that is a special one. That's if I pick this u equal to zero, we are back by definition to the actual problem. So a Rockefellian function really defines a family of perturbations of the problem of interest. So that is an important thing to take with you. Now, how might this look in particular cases? For instance, stochastic optimization, which is an important area today, uh, in particular in the context of machine learning. Conceptually, we think about a machine learning or other stochastic optimization problem to be of this form, where this phi that I've been talking about might involve some sort of regularization term, F0, and then it might involve a sum, sum from i equal to s, where s might be a number of data points that I have. Each of these data points might be giving a weight or a probability, pi. And of course, that pi is often in applications simply 1 over s because we are taking an average, but it could be something else. And then uh, this loss function fi in the back here, uh, you will come from uh, you know, losses in a neural network, cross-entropy loss, for instance, or whatever it might be. So this could be an example of the optimization problem that we have. And maybe there's one thing that we are concerned about, for instance, is changing to these probabilities pi. And we know that is a central topic in areas of machine learning, for instance, where we talk about upweighing and influence functions. We're thinking about what will happen if, for instance, that pi was reduced down to zero, meaning that particular data point was removed from the training process. Will that play a, a big role or what? So this type of sensitivities to change this P could be important. Similar things are entering also in the area of adversarial attacks, corruption and contaminations. We can think about that as being ways of this nominal optimization problem being changed in some way. And we see concrete example of that as we go along. So for instance, one potential Rockefellian that you might be looking at in this context is the following. Remember Rockefellian is about introducing a vector U which represents some sort of perturbation of my problem. And I said I was concerned about changes in P, these probabilities. So maybe one Rockefeller we can define is to define a change to these probabilities represented by U. Of course, now if U is equal to zero, we are back to the actual problem. So this is indeed a Rockefeller. But then we might be worried what happens uh, to the solution of this problem. And the solution is problem might correspond to neural networks, for instance. What will happen to these solutions if we change u away from zero? So that is in a way on, in, in, in the bottom of much of, of, of analysis these days related to upweighing, influence functions, uh, outlier analysis, and things like that. So you might wonder, is this going to be a big deal or not? So I construct a simple example. It's almost ridiculously simple where the optimization problem that I want to minimize is just over a scalar x between 0 and 1. And the expectation I'm talking about is, is a, a rather special. The expectation is of this function g, where xi is random. So think about it as data or something. And then x is what you want to optimize over. And this g has this very simple form. And what's even simpler is the probability measure p. It's actually not much randomness here because I say with probability one, the value of xi is zero. So of course, there's essentially no uncertainty in this problem. So it's really a, a very simple case. And you take one minute to figure out what is the minimizer. It turns out the minimizer here is x equal to one. 
So take that at, at face value to minimize x to one. But now let's see what happens if I just change this probability a little bit. Remember we talked about changes to probability would be something that we might potentially be concerned about. So let's see how concerned we should be about it. And let's make a small change to this probability. So that probability that we have was this step function, right? If you look at the cumulative distribution function, it was this black step function. Well, let's now make a small, tiny change to it, uh, uh, p uh, nu. Uh, this red cumulative distribution function, which has almost the same jump, but then there's a slight discrepancy out here to a value nu, nu potentially a, a large number. So it seems like this seems to be a rather small change from the black to the red. But the question is, what is that so-called small change uh, uh, has, what type of effect does it have on minimizers? So if I now minimize this problem under the red distribution instead of the black, it turns out that now the minimizer becomes zero. It used to be one, but now it's zero. And that is regardless what new that we have. And this takes place even though we see that this p new converge weakly to p. So there seems to be more and more accurate probabilities, but still the expectation don't confer, converge. And of course, this is a well-known thing we know from probability theory that pro converges in weak convergence of probability measures do not necessarily uh, imply convergence of expectations. Uh, we have to bring in tightness and things like that. Uh, so we know uh, this is potentially an issue. Johannes, hi, this is George. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, in that previous plot, I think you want new to be greater than one, right? Because one, you recover exactly the same problem. Oh. Exactly. So, so, so I think about the mu going to infinity. So, so, so new you see on the bottom here is, uh, well, I guess for one, we are kind of back to where we started exactly. And right. then, so that, and then, the and then it keeps big. big. Okay. So new has to be greater than one. Yes. Like okay. So we can start at two. Yeah. Go up at two. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So, what is this Rockefellian going to play? Uh, what type of role can it play in this area? Well, uh, as we're going to see in this talk, we're going to see uh, how uh, it can help, for instance, in the context of statistical learning with incorrect labels. And uh, this Rockefellian function adds flexibility to absorb and identify errors. For instance, we're going to look at pictures like this, where we see uh, training uh, epochs on, on the first axis, and we're looking at accuracy. Uh, and uh, on the picture on the left here is classical empirical risk minimization. This is a, 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 a case of MNIST under label noise. And you see the accuracy on the test set, which is the blue line is hovering around 0.4. But if you pass to the Rockefellian approach that they're going to be describing, we can get up to 75 or something like that, and it has a very stable behavior. So some of this work is also joined with some colleagues at MPS, as well as some uh, people, uh, Bobby Churn and uh, uh, Amog Mahapatra uh, at Meta. So overall, in this talk, we're going to talk about several topics where this Rockefellian function can play an important role. Optimality conditions, sensitivity analysis, relaxations and dual problems. And then we're going to get into the machine learning topic and stochastic optimization under settings where we have some sort of distributional ambiguity, as I alluded to earlier. So let's start with optimality conditions. And this takes us really back to maybe calculus 101. One of the first things you learn in calculus was if you want to minimize a smooth function, uh, phi, uh, then uh, take the gradient set equal to zero. Uh, we know at least that will get you so far, uh, and, uh, and particularly in the convex case, but even in the non-convex case, uh, this would be a necessary optimality condition. But what about non-smooth cases? If you have an arbitrary function phi, it might have kinks. Uh, it might even have the value plus infinity, as I indicate with this bar on top here. So it might be a rather nasty function. Uh, uh, one might come across in applications that are not as well behaved as we have uh, on top there. So then the question is, what type of optimality conditions can we cook up? 
And the classical one, which we call Fermat's rule, is that zero must be a subgradient at a point X. So this curly phi, uh, the, the, the partial phi that I'm writing here, uh, that's this is set of subgradients. So what is a subgradient? Well, this picture hopefully helps you to, to clarify that a little bit. Uh, I, I drew a, a function here that looks rather wild, but let's start over here at the point where the function is nice and smooth. And in that case, the set of subgradients is, uh, is really just a singleton, it's just the gradient. So we're back on familiar smooth territory. If I'm at the point here, which is a point of a kink at the bottom here, uh, if there's a kink here, then we are in a way uh, back in the area of convex analysis where subgradients are well understood and uh, one can define a set of subgradients at all those slope coefficients that kind of span. Well, I guess on the left here, it's some number negative 0.9 I eyeballed. On the right is maybe 1.8, and everything in between will be a subgradient. So there's a whole set in that case. So that's also well understood from convex analysis. What is a little bit more tricky is if you have an inward kink like that, then it turns out that the set of subgradients, at least as we think about it in the sense of Mordukovic, is to take the slope coefficients on, on the left and those on the right, and those two uh, provide the subgradients. We don't need to get into all the details here, but I think the important takeaway here is that one shouldn't shy away from non-convex and non-smooth problems, because we still have this analogy of gradient equal to zero, just now we have to use subgradients. And this is the perspective we took in our recent textbook, an optimization primer, where we tried to promote this view that you know, applications might be non-convex, application might produce non-smooth functions, but it's not really a big deal. We still have a lot of mathematical machinery that we can bring in about subgradients, calculus rules for subgradients and things that, that we can use uh, to do the necessary calculations. And to try to make this uh, uh, connecting to a Rockefellian, uh, we're going to get uh, to this uh, important concept, in my opinion. And the main idea here is that every Rockefellian, at least under a constraint qualification, will produce an optimality condition for my problem. So uh, remember, I was minimizing a function phi, and you guys cook up a Rockefellian, let's call it f, it turns out that that Rockefellian provides an optimality condition in terms of its subgradients. It's a necessary optimality conditions, analogously to what you know from calculus about derivative equal to zero, gradient equal to zero. A Rockefellian will provide an optimality condition. Now, in terms of subgradients of the Rockefellian. Well, this looks a little bit abstract. Maybe we can make it try to make it a little bit more concrete. Uh, one possibility is to look at uh, a problem that is composite of different pieces. Maybe it is of this form. So that phi that I've been talking about all the time might, for instance, involve uh, three pieces. Maybe there's a piece in the back where there's a function h uh, uh, that's composed with f. Uh, maybe there's some other function here. Uh, and then there might be an indicator function here. And when I say indicator function, uh, uh, I mean a function that if, if X is in the set X, I just get zero back. Otherwise I get infinity. So there's a way for me to capture constraints using these infinities that I mentioned earlier. Whatever the case might be, what are examples of this? Well, the reason I bring it up is because stochastic optimization, for instance, in the form that we talked about before, where we have some probabilities pi, where we had some loss function fi, we had a regularizer f0, is indeed exactly in this form that I had on the previous slide. It just uh, corresponds to a particular choice of h. And there's other example as well, if you have equality constraint, that is also in this form, just meaning a particular choice of H. And there are other examples as well. 
So the question is, what type of optimality conditions can we come up with for such a composite problem, which has these three pieces? And maybe some of these pieces are individually a bit nicer. Maybe, for instance, the Fs are smooth, but H might not be, but this instead is convex. Maybe F0 is smooth, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe there's some properties. So the question is, can we use now calculus rules to compute optimality conditions? And based on what we talked about before, that's going to go through two steps. One, define a Rockefellian, and two, come up with subgradients for that Rockefellian. So here's my uh, proposal of a Rockefellian. Remember, Rockefellian involves producing a u vector, introducing it somewhere in the formula. And when u is equal to zero, we should get back to the actual problem. And obviously, if u equals zero, we're back to the original problem. So this is a valid Rockefellian. So then the next step would be to figure out subgradients of that, because the optimality condition looked like this. And this is where I refer to our book, for instance, we can do calculus, same way as when somebody asks you to take the derivative, you're using chain rules and things like that to compute derivatives. In the same way here with subgradients, we can use chain rules to do this type of calculations, and we can get some formulas here that will produce optimality conditions. Johannes, a quick, a yeah. quick question. Are there any restrictions on what the Rockefellian can be? Like, how do you... You can add u or you can add one minus exponential of u or any function that is zero or yes, some restriction. Yes, so, so the definition that I said, I only put in one restriction to become a Rockefellian is that if you put u equal to zero, you should get back to the actual problem. So with, with that tiny restriction, uh, there are so many possibilities. So I think it's not difficult to come up with a Rockefeller. And the question is, can you come up with one that is useful for you, is computationally attractive to you, and has the right. properties that you like? And right. So, yeah, so it's just sort of an embedding, essentially, right? To, uh, exa exactly. It, it embeds a part par parametrization of your problem. Uh, and that parametrization, you, you're free to choose. Uh, it, will, of, of course, would involve uh, uh, changes to things that you somehow care about and would like to analyze. Okay, thanks. So maybe we can look at a, a familiar case of equality constraint. If you take an optimization one on one, you remember optimality condition that goes way whole way back to Lagrange. Uh, and that can also be captured in this case for a particular form of H. It becomes a special case of everything that I've talked about. And indeed, this Rockefellian produces optimality condition that we talked about. And in this particular case, we get the good old Lagrangian equal to zero. So that what you have learned in, in optimization about Lagrangians and things that, that would be a special case, but we now have tools to develop more exotic optimality conditions uh, depending on the need of an application. So let's see how we can make use of these Rockefellians in the context of sensitivity analysis. So uh, it turns out that a Rockefellian is key there as well. So imagine that you're interested in the minimum uh, uh, of, uh, you know, the minimum value of the optimization problem, and how does that change with you? Remember, the Rockefellian defines a family of problems. Each will have a minimum value. How much does it change? That minimum value I denote here by mu as a function of u. Of course, if I take u equal to zero, that's the minimum value of the actual problem that we started out with. So now the question is, how much does it vary as u varies? Again, the key thing is to look at subgradients of these Rockefellians. So we have a formula here that says, if I wonder the, the subgradients or how does uh, the minimum values change with different u's, I would like to know the subgradients of this minimum value function. And it turns out that those are explicitly given by the subgradients of the Rockefellians. Again, we are in the business of trying to compute subgradients or Rockefellians, and I showed you how to do that on the previous slide. And of course, this can be made more concrete in a composite case where we have concrete formulas for it, uh, leveraging some of the things we saw earlier. 
So maybe, you know, I work for the Navy, so I, I should show you at least one picture of a Navy ship. And here is the picture. And uh, I will talk a little bit about how can this sensitivity analysis help the Navy make better decisions. And uh, as you see on the left here, uh, this is a, a guided missile destroyer that is being loaded by missiles. You know, you heard about Tomahawk missiles and other type of missiles. And in fact, uh, any of these uh, destroyers will have uh, this uh, 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 storage area where, where you will load a large number of missiles. You can count how many missiles can fit in here. Uh, and these missiles uh, will be what the ship will have available while at sea. So now, now the question is, what are the missions that this ship need to uh, face when it's at sea? Of course, that's a bit unknown. And not every missile is, is created equal. Some missiles are for uh, anti aircraft defense, other ones are uh, against other ships, other ones are against uh, targets at land, etc. So the question would be what type of missile should you load on board uh, to be able to meet the requirements uh, down the road? And of course, this is not only for one ship, but for the group of ships that will be on a mission together. So what is the best combination of missiles to have aboard? And in particular, how can we make a robust decision when we know that the requirements that these ships will eventually face at sea uh, uh, are, are somewhat unsettled up front? So I'm just going to show you uh, how one can think about it at, at a high level and how it ties together with this abstract development that we have done so far. So I talked about this in mu earlier. That was the minimum value of an optimization problem as a parameter u changes. And u is the one that is somehow unsettled and we want to examine sensitivity to it. So in this case, maybe the thing that we want to be looking at is this, and this is indeed the form. It looks a bit complicated, but that, this is indeed the form of the planning problem that accounts for all these different considerations when we load a ship. So it gets a little bit complicated, but in any case, one would like to obtain the best possible decision X that is in this, the soup indicates in the worst case against various uh, uh, scenarios that might come our way. And that is where this U enters. So in this case, the parameterization U enters in this constraint set on the maximization side. And it tells us how robust uh, uh, one would like to be against possible uh, scenarios. So now the question is, can we somehow predict these changes in the minimum value using this subgradients formula that we talked about? And they're just showing you some numbers. And imagine, of course, we can maybe solve the optimization problem and compute this minimum value as it depends on you uh, in the back here, and it's 9,006 in this case. But it would be much, much more computationally efficient to use these subgradient uh, estimates, because then you only need to solve one problem for the nominal value u equal to zero, and then use subgradient to extrapolate in the same way as we know from calculus, right? One can compute the value of function at a point, and then we can compute a derivative to project or, or to estimate how, how where the function will be down the road. And we can do the same thing here, compute the nominal value mu zero and compute a subgradient that provides an estimate and of course, subgradient is not as accurate as gradients in the smooth case. But still, looking at these numbers, it looks, for instance, at least in some cases, the error is 6%, is 4%. It can be somewhat large, but they sometimes can be small as well. So indeed, these subgradient estimates provide information that is useful and can help us to determine what is the effect of making changes in a particular optimization problem computationally efficiently. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, relaxations and dual problems. And uh, these are important topics uh, when we're going to try uh, to figure out a way of analyzing problems, in particular when they are difficult. So let's step back to where we, we started. We have some optimization problem, uh, minimizing phi, and you have seen some concrete example of that now. 
And then um, somebody's going to propose a Rockefellian. As Suku said, there are many different uh, Rockefellians. The question is, uh, which one should we pick? And that could be a, a big discussion, uh, but uh, everybody can create their own Rockefellians if you want. And now the question is, what can that Rockefellian do for us when it comes to relaxations? So it turns out that every Rockefellian, this is universal, every Rockefellian would construct an optimization problem that looks like this, that is a relaxation of the actual problem. What do I mean with that? That means that if I'm solving this optimization problem, I'm going to be obtaining a minimum value that is lower or equal to that of the actual problem. So this is something that can be important if you want to bound a solution, because obtaining a lower bound on how well one can do is often all what you need to be able to bracket a solution in some sense. So let's look now at this relaxation. Uh, and why is it a relaxation? Well, first of all, the actual problem involves minimization over X. That's it. But when we move to the Rockefellian, we have both U and X at play. So if we minimize over both X and U, and U equal to zero is an alternative there, and U equal to zero gets us back to an objective function that is exactly the same as phi. So this must be a relaxation because we can only do better at potentially picking other U's. And that holds regardless of which parameter Y that I'm picking here. So I snuck in Y a little bit on the side there. So what is this Y? Well, Y you can think of as a tuning parameter. I could just as well have picked it zero maybe, and then you wouldn't even have that linear term in the back. But this U can be a tuning parameter to help you to produce a better relaxation. And with that, I mean a relaxation that is higher up. Because certainly when I have a relaxation, I would like to have one that is as high as possible because that produces a, a tighter relaxation. So this is what we call Rockefellian relaxation. So we have our actual problem, we produce a Rockefellian, which then gets us a Rockefellian relaxation that is a, just another optimization problem that provides a lower bound on the minimum value of the actual one. It turns out that this is fundamentally connected with all of duality from, from optimization. So this Rockefellian relaxation defines a dual problem. And that dual problem is all about fiddling with that Y that we talked about. So what we see here, the minimum over X and U, that's what I call the Rockefellian relaxation for a fixed Y. But if now we try to find the best Y, what was that doing again? That brought up that lower bound by finding the maximum lower bound will bring it up towards the minimum value of the actual problem. And it turns out this actually had deep connections with conjugate functions. Uh, that is what I'm alluding to here in the back. But the important thing that is that a dual problem is simply a way of constructing a lower bound on the minimum of the actual. And might even hope that that lower bound goes the whole way up. It generally might not, but it might go the whole way up uh, to the minimum of the actual problem. And we have then what we call strong duality. So you might wonder, I've talked a little bit about Lagrange uh, earlier. So, so where's, where's Lagrange in all of this? It turns out that every Rockefellian defines a Lagrangian in a generalized sense. So if I define the Lagrangians as a bivariate function of X and Y, as that minimum of this type of expression that we talked about when the minimum is only taken over U, that is actually what we now call in this general sense a Lagrangian. And the Lagrangian that you're familiar from optimization 101 will come at a special cases, in particular composite settings where the where the Rockefellian is chosen, is your choice, but the Rockefellian has been chosen in a particular way. But there are many other possibilities uh, that one can experiment with. And just to convince you of that, uh, that 
Lagrangian that you're familiar with, you see it on the bottom. Lagrangian is something about the objective function plus a weighted combination of the equality constraint function. Uh, uh, inequality constraint function looks like I'm talking about inequality. So these, these y's here are then the Lagrange multipliers that you might remember are supposed to be non-negative and you see that here. So that will come out as a special case. Okay, let me show you how this can be used in a concrete uh, uh, case uh, to develop a computation efficient method. And this has to do with routing uh, a drone through enemy airspace. So imagine that you want to fly a drone from the origin on the bottom here to some destination on the top uh, right corner. And uh, uh, this is a 3D uh, flight path. I only show you the 2D version, but this is a 3D flight path through the terrain. And you want to use terrain masking here because unfortunately there are some bad guys here that are trying to shoot you down. And that's what's indicated by this red circle. So inside this red circle, you run the risk of being shot down and same as in that little red circle there. But then there are two big red circles too uh, that is also a, a threat region. Of course, uh, whether you be shot down or not, that's not a certainty, and it depends uh, on, on the line of sight from the center of the circle, which is the location of that surface air missile site. Uh, so maybe if you could do terrain masking, you can avoid uh, being shot down. But regardless of what it is, you have now two concerns in your route planning. One is to reduce the risk or minimize the risk along your trajectory. And number two is to minimize flight time or fuel expenditure or something like that. So the two concerns. So the first, we want to minimize risk. And then the second one, we're going to put a hard constraint that said, I would like to get to my destination within a certain time. So there's an objective function and there's a constraint. It turns out that makes this problem that at first might have looked like a, a shortest path problem, it actually now what we call a constrained shortest path problem because we have not only an objective function, we also have a constraint. And that actually makes this problem NP hard. So that is a bit troubling. And also there could be multiple constraints and I indicate that here, in fact, we might even have Q constraints uh, in a general setup. But Rockefellians can come in and save the day. This problem can be formulated like this. So this is, I guess, our function phi that we've been talking about all along. And then we want to introduce a Rockefellian. In this case, I chose the following Rockefellian where there's like a changes to the constraints. And then we can solve uh, or formulate a Lagrangian and solve the Lagrangian uh, or, or, or the Rockefellian relaxation, which in this case also is called the Lagrangian relaxation. Johanna, and then nicely, yeah. Johanna, can, you, can you please, uh, in the first line, can you tell us which, uh, because you have so many circles there, so many constraints. How, where are the constraints? The constraints are on the, no, no, on the mathematical expression. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, so so it, so it they yeah. they come in this in this uh, coefficient c. So uh, I I compute there there were three uh, sorry I think there were four circles meaning there are four threats but I'm kind of combining them uh, so they will all be combined in this coefficient c. So the the a few background details. First of all, the space has been discretized. So uh, we are talking about uh, a discrete set of, of uh, arcs and nodes that we're going to travel along in 3D space. And along each arc, we're going to assume independence. So when these guys are shooting at us, it's going to be an independence assumption uh, that their success is going to be independent of previous tries. Under the assumption, actually, we can uh, compute this coefficient c, and that they become uh, some sort of a, a risk associated with going in a particular arc, and the algorithm trying to find uh, those arcs that I guess in, in totality has the lowest risk in some sense. Okay. 
And the, the, what I talked about, some sort of fuel constraint or time constraint, that will be hidden inside this matrix D. And maybe the time limit will be the little d, or the fuel limit will be the little d. So those will be the constraints and, and the objective function here. So now the question is, the constraints is what makes this a constrained shortest path problem. But if I define a Rockefellian in this fashion, I can go through a calculation via Lagrangian. And at the end of the day, if I now minimize this Lagrangian over X, it might be a little bit hard to see in one minute, but it turns out that this Lagrangian will turns out to just be a linear function in X for a fixed Y. So it turns out that if I just want to minimize this in this Lagrangian X is just the shortest path problem, which is solvable in polynomial time. So I can do that really well. So I somehow remove this constraint through a Rockefellian relaxation process. And by doing so, I got back to something that I can do very computationally efficient, but there's a catch. Remember the Rockefellian relaxation provided a lower bound. I kept on showing you that. So what I'm solving now is a relaxation of the problem. So I'm not guaranteed optimality, but I'm guaranteed to get a lower bound that I can use in connection with enumeration to maybe get a better solution if I'm not happy with the one that I'm getting. But I always get a performance guarantee through a lower bound. So you want me to uh, talk uh, until top of the hour or a little bit before? No, yeah, up to you. Uh, no, 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 no limit. Okay, even better. <laughs> okay, so uh, 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 we're making good progress. So, so uh, uh, just 10 more slides, so 10 15 minutes should be good. So, we're going to um, uh, now see uh, a little bit about how Rockefellians uh, play a role in stochastic optimization, uh, in particular in the context of machine learning. So, this is a problem I talked to you a little bit about in the beginning where this phi that I've been describing for you, uh, it might be of this particular form where there's maybe a regularizer, and then there's some sort of an average over data points. Each data point is assigned a probability pi, which might very well be one over s, but it could be something else. And then there's some sort of loss function. So this might be my optimization problem. And one thing that bothered us in the beginning of the talk was what happens if the probability is here, the weight that we are assigning to different examples or different data points, if that somehow it changed. So if you replaced his P by something we can call P new, and even we had even examples about that in the, past, in, in the beginning of the talk, that this could be some sort of concerning. What is the effect of such a change? Can we quantify it? So uh, we have now uh, our, our marching orders to develop a Rockefellian. So a Rockefellian will introduce a, a parameter vector u uh, that somehow changed the problem. And I'm going to give you in this case, uh, you know, two Rockefellians, start with one first. And uh, in fact, this first one I'm going to uh, tell you about is a rather uh, unusual one in the sense that, okay, I introduced the u here. That seems to make sense because if I take u equal to zero, I'm back to the actual problem here. But then I add something at the end here. Remember that little i actually is the Greek yota. Uh, and that is the indicator function. So indicator function of the set zero. So in this case, u is, must be equal to zero for this to go away. Or if u is not zero vector, then this will be an infinity altogether. So this is certainly a Rockefellian, but maybe a little bit of an odd one. But whatever it is, it's a valid Rockefellian, so maybe we can run with it. So now uh, let's not lose track of what we really uh, are concerned about is what happens when p replaced by an approximation p new or some sort of corruption or something is something is being messed uh, messed up with those probabilities so we certainly have an approximation that's going to come our way and i'm going to indicate that by f new so everything is the same 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 except the probabilities now have been replaced by this p new because that's what we are, we are worried about so everything is the same same Oh, here's one thing that is changed. Remember I had that indicator function? And of course, an indicator function is not something that's very appealing from a numerical point of view. So I'm going to be approximating by a two norm with a penalty term theta, 
Okay, so this seems to be uh, an approximation of this term. And then there's one last part here, which is another indicator function of this delta, which is the probability simplex. And it's just simply saying, I would like to look at P nu plus u that indeed are probability vectors, because I want this stuff in front of the loss function to be probabilities, non-negative, summing to one. Uh, and you know, certainly I don't want to look at anything else. So, so be it, this is the thing. So now the question is, what will happen? Or is it even a good idea? to minimize jointly in u and x of this approximating function. Remember, we had the actual problem on top here, and we might say, hey, if I'm concerned about p, and maybe I don't even have p in hand, and I just have an approximation p nu, I might just run with that. But that was exactly one of the things that caused us trouble in the beginning when we had this red and the black, those type of situations where we might have uh, incorrect probabilities and could, if we just naively plug them in, the incorrect probabilities, we might get solutions that are far away from those of the actual problem. So here's a proposal on the table, and it's on the bottom on the slide, is that let's now minimize this approximation of the Rockefellian jointly in U and X. So, is that a good idea? Well, it turns out that we have strong theoretical backing for that. Under very mild assumptions, which basically nothing about convexity, nothing about smoothness, pretty wild functions that you can have, as long as this theta, this penalty parameter goes to infinity at a certain rate, then if I minimize this approximating problem that I propose on the bottom, and these solutions are converging to something, that something must be u equal to zero and x minimizes the actual problem. Meaning that this is a roundabout way to produce the solution of the actual problem, even though we might have, might not have the actual probabilities, we just have the approximating probabilities, we can pass to the Rockefellian relaxation. So that is a consistency result, but we have also a rate of convergence. So we have like a non-asymptotic uh, error as well, uh, which is of this order. So remember, the source of the trouble here is that the probabilities are incorrect. So my P nu is not the same as P. But whatever that distance is, if I raise it to power two-third, that gives me an error, and that is the error in the X that I'm producing. So the decision that I'm producing is going to have an error that is the error in the probabilities raised to power two thirds. So you may wonder what, what am I really doing here? Uh, I'm, I'm proposing to minimize jointly in U and X. This was the essence of Rockefellian relaxation. Instead of optimizing only over X, we optimize over X and U. So I said, well, this is a theoretical reason for doing that, but what am I really doing? Is there any interpretation of what's going on? And it turns out in the case that I just showed you, I can carry out this optimization in you somewhat explicitly to get a formula like this. So this thing on top is the same here on the middle. And this thing on the middle start getting looking a little bit familiar because this looks exactly if we ignore the red part for the moment, this looks like exactly like the original problem with the probabilities being replaced by the approximating probabilities. But that was exactly what I told you not to do, but we're not doing it because we are indeed adding this red term at the end. And what is this red term? It's a regularization type term. And we know regularization often is is important thing to do. And here we have it again. And by the way, I have the exact formula for this regularization term here. This is a bit of a mouthful, but whatever the formula is, is a regularization term. It's a non-negative term. But here's something that that you might have noticed that this regularization term comes with a subtraction. So this is really not what we usually see as a plus regularization. It's minus regularization. So this is the difference between many of these other regularization techniques that we see in literature. This is kind of like a negative regularization. And so that is what's being proposed. 
And, you know, I said, I can want to give you other Rockefellians too. Well, here's another one, just to, to, to spice it up, we can define other Rockefellians to show that there are many possibilities. This is a one where we have a one norm here. I think the earlier one we dealt with a two norm, but now we have a one norm. So this maybe has a little bit flavor of lasso or something. But say I run with that and construct an approximation of it, because remember, we need to introduce approximating probabilities. And suppose we, we run with this one, uh, we can get a very similar theoretical result, pretty much identical in this case, as we had in the previous one. But why don't we look at some numerical results to see how all of this can maybe gain us some advantages in some way. And uh, let me look at a, a couple of cases. First, think about outliers. So I'm constructing a very simple example here where we have 60,000 images from MNIST. So these are the handwritten numbers. But then some clever adversary has introduced a corruption. So we don't only have the 60,000 MNIST images, we also have 600 characters, so handwritten letters. And those we're going to give random labels to. Uh, of course, they are not numbers, so they're giving us given a number. Um, so there's some sort of corruption that's taking place in our training data set. And we might not even be aware of this. So we are in possession of what I've been calling the approximating or the incorrect probability. I called them P new earlier. So probably the naive thing one will do if you don't know about all of these things going on is that one will simply set all these 60,600 data points or images that we have, give them each the same probability, same weight, each one of them, one over 60,600. But of course, that is not correct. So the correct probability is what I called P earlier, will of course to set the MNIST examples, give them one over 60,000 in, in probabilities. And those characters that are not supposed to be there, uh, those should have probability zero, of course, to clean them out. So one thing that we might be doing is we might don't know anything about it, but this Rockefeller, and we just naively solve the empirical risk a minimization problem using these incorrect probabilities. But that's what I've been talking about the whole along, that this is a bit of a dangerous path, a uh, dangerous thing to do because you might get error that even if the probabilities actually are fairly accurate, you might get uh, probabilities or, 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 or decisions. You might get X uh, minimizers that are far away from those that you would like. So let's see if we do our uh, proposed approach using uh, Rockefellian uh, relaxation. Uh, here is the Rockefellian. Uh, you've seen this Rockefellian before, and we want to minimize it. And let's now pause for a moment and say, hey, we're going to be minimizing this uh, Rockefellian. Uh, and that is a minimization over U and X. How can we even do that? And it turns out uh, that uh, I think this can be an active area of research, how to optimize jointly in U and X in these type of settings. But uh, we can observe the following thing that we take advantage in this uh, numerical study, at least, that we can do an alternating direction, optimizing first over U and then over X and alternate back and forth. And optimization over U turns out to simply just be linear programming in this case, so it'd be done very quickly. Or we can use also do some sort of subgradient descent. And optimization over X in this case, well, uh, if I fixed U, the optimization over X is just a, a classical machine learning type of a training problem. And we can use SGD or, or Adam or any of those uh, algorithms that are uh, well developed. So if we do that uh, and, and produce some results, uh, let me see what, let me show you something that, that might happen. Remember on this uh, data set, we had this corruption that there are 600 characters that have been introduced to our training data set, uh, maybe without us knowing about it. We carry out this optimization that I'm proposing, the Rockefellian relaxation. And we, you might wonder, what are the use that we are obtaining? And here's a histogram of the use. It turns out on the left bar, we have 544 
images. And these are 544 images of the 600 characters. And they have been given a U value. And you see the value here is negative 1.5. Actually, here a little bit to left, it negative 1.5. 1.65 and it's 10 to minus 5. So we is given used at a negative 165, 10 to minus 5. And if you remember from this previous slide, that was exactly the incorrect probabilities that those examples had been given. So this U now, really what I call knocks out those images. So it cleans them out. So the term in front here becomes zero for those images, 544 at least of them, uh, that are incorrectly being inserted into the data set. So we discover it adaptively as part of the training process. Uh, here is a, a pictures I showed you earlier, and this has to do with accuracy on a test uh, data set. And this is a little bit in a different setting where, uh, again, we are on the MNIST setting, but the, there's no corruption of characters here. Instead, there's label swapping. So in this case, I'm trying to make life hard for myself and take 65% of the training uh, uh, data and switch the labels to just cause, cause a bit of a mess in the training data. And then I will go out ahead and train, for instance, using classical empirical risk minimization, uh, pretending that I don't know anything about this uh, label uh, swapping. And what you'll see there that the training accuracy uh, uh, it goes uh, way up uh, near near one, so I guess it looks very rosy. But when we test it, which is the blue, uh, we see this is hovering around 0.4. Uh, so really, we haven't really learned that much uh, in this neural network. Um, we are kind of fitting uh, these uh, swapped labels. But if we instead doing a Rockefellian business, so what is that? Remember that is an optimization of both U and X. So what that U portion is doing is working on trying to identify troublesome data points and kind of cleaning it up during the training process. So it's sort of a self-cleaning process. And in fact, in this particular problem instance, among the 1,200, 104 mislabeled data, 10,000, more than 10,000 are being cleaned up adaptively during the Rockefellian relaxation solution. In fact, there are some of the, of the clean data that is also being removed, but not that many, 1,000 out of 6,000. So it's not like we are, are perfect. There, is, there are some uh, cleaning out of some of those other ones that maybe shouldn't have been cleaned up, but it doesn't seem to have too much of a detrimental effect when you look at test accuracy. And test accuracy here is, is around uh, 0.75 or something, uh, which is pretty good with this high level of contamination. I've also been working a little bit with some people at Meta, uh, where they are particularly interested in studying identifying toxic comments. Uh, yeah, on, on Facebook and places like that. And uh, that is a situation, I, I guess this is a bit of a good news uh, that uh, it, it is not that much toxic comments online. So you have a low prevalence setting. So you have one class toxic, which is a low prevalence, maybe something like 3% prevalence and 97% of, of the data, training data, et cetera, uh, might be non-toxic. So that's an additional challenge. But then you also had mislabeling. But of course, what is toxic and not toxic? You know, what, what uh, Meta does, right, is sends all these posts to some, some place in the world where people are sitting and, and classify, oh, this is toxic, this is not toxic, and it's done manually to, uh, uh, to, to produce a training data set. And that is, of course, subject to errors. So in such a situation, you might think, uh, can Rockefellian relaxation play a role? And we compare in this picture, this is somewhat preliminary, uh, Rockefellian relaxation, depending on the noise level, this is about how much error do we have? Uh, I mean, the labeling people, how much errors do they make when they're labeling toxic versus not toxic? But it seems like we have like a 5% maybe advantage of empirical risk minimization when we look at uh, a precision recall, for instance, in this case. 
that's all what I want to say. Uh, I, I covered a lot of ground in different areas, but a key takeaway is that I think this Rockefellian uh, function uh, can offer a lot of analysis, both in terms of sensitivity uh, analysis, in terms of optimality condition, computational methods, and in machine learning concretely, uh, how to uh, uh, maybe adaptively clean up a data set uh, while training. So we have some references here uh, for those that are interested. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Roisit. Do we have questions for him? May, may I ask a question? Yes, here we go. Ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Hello. I'm Yu Yu from Lehigh University. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot for, for the great talk. So, yeah, I have a question about the negative regularization. So, is there any like intuition about why to impose this? regularization can like that is that because you are going to make the problem maybe from physical intuition of the problem or maybe to make the optimization problem maybe a little bit more convex yes yeah, so i think uh, the, the the intuition actually goes back uh, if you allow me to be a little bit technical uh, you know and then we can talk oh, yeah, more yeah. loosely it, it is it is actually ties to fatu's lemma and what we know from mm -hmm. Fatou's lemma is that uh, there's a lim in statement, meaning that if you have convergence in distributions, expectations mm -hmm. can be too high mm -hmm. in the approximation coming in towards a limit, which is a lower. So we have a situation, we have a stochastic optimization problem because the probabilities are incorrect. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they might produce too high expected values. So one has to bring it down. And that negative relaxation brings it down. So, so, so you're coming into high, so we need to bring it down. And that is uh, the key reason why relaxation in this case, or, or, or like a negative re uh, regularization is important because it brings down this objective function that is somehow is incorrect. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, thank you so much. So is this introduced in, like, say, one of the literature, the references you, you put here? Or, yeah, so, yeah so, I, I want to learn more details. Yeah, I mean, in the in, in a machine learning setting, take a look at this uh, paper on top here, which is in archives. Uh, it's, a, it's a second review in a journal, so hopefully it should be out soon, but it, it has been in archives since last year. So you can take a look at that, uh, which provides uh, a, a domain a development, uh, I think. Uh, and, and feel free to send me an email if, if it doesn't make sense. Okay, yeah, that would be fantastic. Thank you so much. Maybe, uh, uh, Jerome, do you have any comments on uh, Rockefellian? Hi, thank you very much, Johannes. I mean, yes, I know about the Rockefellian and so on. Did you establish the connections with um, the variational principle of Eckerland and so on? Because one way to look at that, for many of your examples, it turns out that you construct perturbation that yields to solution to hamilton jacobi PDEs. And one way to prove the viscosity solution would be to invoke the Clark differentiability and the variational uh, principle of Eckerland. And I was wondering if you did pursue this uh, line of research, or you did stick, uh, you decided to stick to the general formulation without going to the PDEs. Yes. So uh, good, good, good point. And of course, you know. This thing about considering perturbations of an optimization problem is, is a very old idea, and you me mentioned Ivar Ekeland uh, and many other people have looked at what, what are the effect of perturbation in various ways, and, and we know this has been a very fruitful thinking. What I talked about here was everything was in finite dimensions, so I, I didn't get into PD, but let me mention one thing, and uh, maybe two things. In this paper with Eugene Feinberg, um, we are making the first effort to, to try to uh, uh, think about in our work, at least, uh, effort to think about uh, these Rockefellians in an infinite dimensional setting, which eventually will uh, affect uh, or, or influence maybe uh, PD problems. Uh, not on this reference list, I'm working with uh, uh, Harbier until at, at George Mason University with uh, indeed a, a PDE constrained optimization problem where we're trying to use 
this Rockefellian thinking, uh, which you know is a is a somewhat of a problem specific setting. So uh, so we haven't thought about in general, uh, uh, or I haven't thought about in general in in the PD setting. I think there's much work there, of course. You know, as, as you mentioned, the French school uh, has has been, you know, um, uh, active in this area in general. Of course, not using the term Rockefellian, uh, which is just something that we proposed over the last couple of years. But uh, I think there's much interesting work there that can be done. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there more questions for him? If not, thank you, Professor Roysit, for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, we'll move on to our uh, next speaker. So our uh, second speaker is uh, Johannes Mueller. He would be talking to us about theoretical analysis of boundary penalties for neural network-based PDE solvers. He obtained his PhD in mathematics from the University of Freiburg and the University of Warwick, and since 2020, he has been a PhD student at the International Max Planck Research School for Mathematics and Sciences. He is supervised by Nihayat I and Gaida Muntufa, and his research interests include Markov decision process, information geometry, algebraic statistics, and neural network-based PDE solvers. With that, uh, please join me in welcoming him. Yes, thanks a lot for, for this kind invitation. Do you see my slides still? Um, yeah, perfect. Um, yes, as was already said, I'm going to talk about um, some work I did together with Marius, who's going to basically take over after half an hour, 40 minutes, um, to talk a little bit about the more um, practical things we've been doing lately. And in my part, I'm going to focus on the theoretical aspects, especially of the boundary penalty method for different PDE solvers. Um, yeah, and... I'm going to tell you what we've been up to in that regard. So um, I guess most people here in the audience are quite familiar with um, you know, network-based PDE solvers um, or approaches to, to solving PDEs. Um, one obviously very um, yeah, successful approach that gets a lot of attention are so-called physics-informed neural networks. And, just putting the slide here to tell you that people are super excited about it. If you just consider the amount of papers that have been published, I mean, this stopped like in 2021, this sort of graphic, but I'm pretty sure it continued on to grow like this. Um, and one very fundamental flaw or difficulty um, that you have is like, I mean, these solvers are sometimes quite easy to implement. Um, because, I mean, basically you have all the um, yeah, software available with like modern machine learning libraries. So it is quite easy to set them up. But once you do this and you let them run, you see that usually the error doesn't really go down super quickly um, in the sense that basically, and also Marius is going to talk about this, you're going to reach a plateau quite often that sits around like 10 to the minus three relative error. and um, there are certain methods to, to go past this, um, but it's not quite straightforward. Um, and I mean, here in these graphics, you see simple gradient descent, which is here the green line. You see Adam, which is the red line. It performs here sort of the best. Um, and then you have um, uh, BFGS um, as a pink line, but that is sort of spiky here. Um, yeah, and it already we put in quite a considerable amount of, of, of um, yeah, computation, even if you would continue this for more time, would look roughly the same and sort of stagnate. And one, I mean, this basically, this finding um, leads people to the conclusion that there are a lot of like theoretical questions um, about pins and that are not well understood. And one is like, I mean, what does it converge to? Like, does it converge? Like, basically, where's, where's the problem in, in this convergence? Um, how, like what is going on? Um, and I would say that basically the same applies for other neural network based PDE solvers, but I mean, this citation just states it for pins here. Um, and yeah, this is what basically 
led um, to Marius and my interest. So, in just, yes. Just a answer to that question. There's a paper mm -hmm. by Shin, Darbon, and Karniadakis that show that pins converge to the solution for linear parabolic and elliptic equations. Yes. That was um, several years ago. Yes. So um, there are different convergence results and error estimates, um, and I'm aware of that. But we focus on specifically the effect of the boundary penalty method. And I'm hoping to convince you later on when we show our results that basically, um, I mean, yes, that when you add a boundary penalty method or you have exact boundary penalty, the situation is slightly different, um, like in the convergence guarantees that you that you have. And I agree for pins, the question is easier. For the deep roots method, it is slightly more subtle, but yes. Does it answer your question for now? Yeah, yeah, I, I, because I, I, you sort of you posed a question by this paper, but there was an answer that uh, whenever the paper was published in 22, yes. I have to read the paper, but but you know, there are lots of people can ask lots of questions, but uh, <laughs> some answers. Yes. Are, uh, <laughs> yes. Are, yeah, I didn't mean to derail you. Please go ahead. No, no, that's fine. Um, I agree. Like, um, there are a lot of works on, on it, precisely this questions, but this wasn't quite true when we started working on this. Um, so yes, and uh, I'm also going to cite you later. So we're going to see what what the differences in our analysis are um, a bit. Yeah, cool. Yes, so as I said, we are specifically going to focus on the effect of boundary values and um, that, yeah, and we're going to analyze these effects that you have. Um, and. Basically, there are two approaches that you can always do. You can either design a system, so neural network based functions um, that have exact boundary values that you want, or you can relax the problem and just penalize these boundary values in order to enforce them approximately. And it is quite interesting that in the, with these two approaches, you get different convergence guarantees. And first, um, we worked on the deep roots method because sort of yeah, that's what we started with. And um, here the analysis is a little bit more subtle um, because when you do the penalization of the boundary values, you basically change your optimization problem. And um, basically your solution of the, or your approximate solution is going to converge to the solution of a different PDE. And then um, depending on how you do the regularization, if you do it smartly, you can still show that your solution is going to converge in H1 with the rate that is, um, so with the rate here, I mean the exponent basically in, in like, um, it's it's a power law decay in the exponent um, and that convergence or in, in that decay rate, how the deep roots method um, uh, reconstructs the solution of the PDE you're going for is half at least half the approximation the exponent in the approximation rate so basically you're losing speed with having to penalize um, and yes it is very different if you have a neural network based ansatz class that has exact boundary values because there things are pretty easy because i mean you're just using some parametric system to um, solve a strongly convex um, yeah or co coercive um, problem and for pins, um, I mean, and that is precisely, if I understand it correctly, the result that you also had, um, that basically your solution is going to converge in H one half, given that you have um, that your um, that your neural networks are H two universal approximators and with the exact same rate, but the convergence happens in a different norm than your have your universal approximation rate, um, and. This changes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. A, a question here. So you're yes. assuming that the optimizer is perfect. There's no optimization error per se. This is more of yes. the theory, right? Yes. And yeah. and in a, in addition for the RIS, is it the fact that your problem becomes actually a Robin boundary condition, right? When you have Precisely, penalty, yeah. and yeah, then yeah. therefore it's not converging unless beta, unless beta goes to infinity, right? Then you converge to the direct line. Right. Problem. Right. That's basically what I'm all, all everything that I'm going to tell you. <laughs> oh, yeah. okay, okay. Yeah. But uh, so it's, so it's different from the pins, right? With boundary penalty. Precisely. Yeah. It's yeah. kind of yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. But yes, for pins, something different happens if if you work with exact boundary values, 
then not your convergence rate improves, but basically the norm in which you get the convergence um, and it jumps up to an H2 convergence, which is just I mean a direct yeah, um, consequence of H2 regularity of these problems. The, Johannes, this is also mm -hmm. another paper that we uh, had here, somebody from uh, Stanford with Lexing Ying uh, was working okay. uh, where he compared the uh, variational the, the deep reach, what's called deep reach here, with versus pin. So, it, so they found similar things. Although he didn't, he didn't focus on uh, on the effect of the boundary penalization, mm -hmm. but just the the fact that actually pin has a faster rate of convergence compared to deep reach, because effectively what we do is an H two norm. We use a, effectively we use H two norm as opposed to H one norm that deep reach is using. Yeah. 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 Cool. I'm not. 100% sure whether I know this paper, but um, maybe you can let me know the precise reference. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, now I think we have a pretty good overview of what's going to happen, and we can just see, um, yeah, what is our schedule for today. So now you already know the results and, and basically also the methods that, that we're using. Um, but we can explain them in a little bit more detail. Um, and first, I'm going to just set up the notation, um, which probably a lot of people are going to be familiar with. Then we can have a look at the de Brutz method and then um, yeah, at pins or residual minimization as we referred it to. And yeah, maybe as I, as I said, a lot of these results, maybe not all, um, they're sometimes going to use the assumption that we can control the training error or that we don't have any training error. And this is a strong assumption, but sort of it is like asking what is the best that we can hope for? Like assume that we were able to solve our optimization problem. What could we at least hope for? All right. So um, just for the Brits method, we're going to work with the Dirichlet problem. Um, and we're going to assume zero boundary values just to spare a little bit of notation. But obviously, you can set it up for different, um, I mean, Dirichlet um, boundary values. And we're going to assume that our right hand side lies in L2. Um, so that will be crucial actually for our analysis. And we're going to um, denote the neural network or a neural network function with u theta, which is a function from RD to R um, that is computed by some sort of neural network architecture. For now, we're not going to care too much about what type of neural network it is. Um, and I mean, obviously you, we want to, yeah, um, design a method how to approximate the actual solution. And um, I mean, as I said, for us, it's not super important with what neural networks we work um, and what a neural network is. We just like to think about it as some sort of parametric function class. But in case anyone is, I mean, wants to actually know like what we think of, um, we think obviously of feedforward networks, which are a concatenation of a fine linear functions with yeah, um, coordinate wise applied non-linearities. Um, and yes, um, so the parameters in the parametric function class are, are gonna be the, basically the parameters of the affine linear transformations. But I hope everyone is familiar with that unless please, or otherwise please just like, ask any questions, but I don't want to spend too much time on this. All right, so what does the DBRITS method do? Um, it is basically the idea is to work with the variational formulation of the PDE. Um, and I mean, I guess that a lot of people know that um, the solution is the unique minimizer to, of, of this energy um, over the function space of weakly differentiable functions with zero boundary values. And it actually dates back to, to 1990, where Walter Ritz proposed that if you wanted to solve such a variational problem, or actually also an abstract variational problem, you could simply work with a parametric function class um, and then basically minimize this function over the parameters. And um, he tried to do this by hand, like for polynomial systems, for example. Um, and in 2018, Wen and Yu and Yu, um, yeah, suggested to, to use this for the training of the or optimization of the parameters of a neural network. So that's why it's called deep Ritz method because these networks are typically deep. And um, one 
thing if you work with networks, also sometimes with polynomials, is um, that it is or it can be hard to exactly design a neural network type function that has exact boundary values. And what you can do instead is that you can simply add a penalization term that, I mean, yeah, penalizes the function, uh, the boundary values, and then, um, yeah, that enforces them approximately. But, um, oh yeah, no but, just, I mean, still notation, um, but we're gonna see that it changes things a little bit later. The second thing we're gonna work with are pins or physics in front neural networks that um, work with a different formulation as a minimization problem. Um, and yes, I mean, they work with the fact that um, you star or yours a solution, you star the solution as the unique minimizer of this um, yeah, energy over the yeah, space of functions with, with zero boundary values that are twice differentiable. And I mean, the corresponding um, objective function for the training of the neural network parameters looks like this. And I mean, this approach has already been yeah, suggested quite a while back um, in the 90s and was recently very successfully yeah, um, promoted and applied um, to different settings. I mean, I could continue this list as super, I mean, just important references there. Um, also, obviously, by people here at Brown. And um, I mean, in general, I mean, I'm not going to talk about this in, in a lot of detail, maybe a little bit later, um, because I mean, now we're just like doing a little bit of theory. Um, instead, you will have to obviously discretize all these integrals. And the way you do this plays an important role in the actual performance of these algorithms. Um, and obviously, the attractive thing here is that you can not only use a PDE term, but also combine it with a data term that comes from possibly physical measurements. Yes, and now, um, now basically, I can tell you what, what sparked our interest in, in these boundary values is, um, I mean, as I said, it is hard to design, or I mean, maybe if you have some neural network architecture, it is not quite clear like what parameters will give you zero boundary values or if there are any parameters that will give you zero boundary values. So you're gonna have to do a little trick if you don't wanna penalize them. Um, and basically what you can do is you can design a function that goes from your domain to zero one that vanishes on the boundary, but not in the interior of, 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 of your domain. And then you can simply multiply your neural network function that you designed with that function. And then you're gonna have a parametric class of functions that has exact zero boundary values. And people, um, yeah, people have observed empirically, I mean, there's a lot of work on this, um, that if you work with exact boundary values, um, your convergence and also your optimization is gonna be a lot nicer. Um, and we're not gonna talk about the optimization too much in this talk, but more about um, yeah the theoretical implications um, yeah of, um, about the convergence part. All right. Um, if there are no questions to our setup, um, I can continue and show you our results for the De Brits method. Um, and yes, as I said, um, basically we're changing the optimization problem or the variation problem that we start off with um, by allowing for non-zero boundary values. So we're enlarging the space, but we're penalizing. And the problem is, um, as I mean, already was pointed out, they have different solutions um, and that is something we need to account for. So if we do this, then um, yeah, I mean, this is just a setup slide once more um, to remind you of our notation. Um, so um, we work with, I mean, here a more general elliptic equation, um, but that's not super important. If you want to think about it, you can obviously think about the Poisson equation. Um, and yes, then I can maybe already talk you through our, our result that um, we have for the de Brits method with boundary penalties. So 
basically, if we have some mm, some class of functions that we called here we that can be a parametric function class, then um, the distance of, of that element v to the solution of the PDE is bounded by, by a sequence of terms. Um, and we can spend a little bit of time on this. So the first term um, basically corresponds to the optimization error. So um, that is how, I mean, how basically how well we do in optimizing our penalized energy with respect to the function class that we consider. So how far away is our point in that function class if measured in energy from the minimizer or the infimum of the energy over that function class. Then the second term um, is an approximation error term. So we measure how well we can approximate um, u lambda, where u lambda is the solution of our penalized problem. And um, yes, that is also measured in our basically um, in our energy norm that corresponds to our penalized problem. And then as a third term, we have a penalization term um, that gets small if our penalty gets large. And here, I mean, for this result, we don't need any assumptions in a sense, like we don't need assumptions about perfect training. This just decomposes our error into the, these different terms. And um, just to convince you that this is something that you can read something interesting off is, um, as I told you, we have the optimization error, we have the approximation error, and we need to measure this in the energy norm. And the energy norm consists of the L2 norm of the functions plus lambda times the gradient norms, L2 norm of the gradients. And so this approximation error will get large if lambda gets large. And our penalization error requires lambda to be large. So there will be a trade-off in this error bound when we choose lambda. And this sort of makes sense because if we choose lambda too small, we will have large boundary values. If we choose lambda too big, we will have zero boundary values but not solve the PDE very well. And I mean, just a sketch of the proof that it was already basically pointed out how it's going to work. I mean, you can simply um, yeah, decompose the error into the how well you approximate the solution of the penalized problem, and then how much you change your optimization problem. And you lambda, um, I mean, the first term is quite easy to estimate. That's just like basically an energy estimate. Um, and the second term um, that solves, or I mean, this is this approximate problem or a penalized problem um, solves a Robin boundary value problem. And then you're left with estimating this, um, yeah, this difference. And I mean, there exist um, estimates on this difference, but we had to work a little, yeah, a little bit extra because they usually work for um, problems where you have strong coercivity on the whole space of H1, which you don't have if you don't add like here a strongly convex term um, to this divergence term. So we had to yeah, redo a little bit of the machinery and yeah, make sure that everything works nicely. All right, um, so far so good. Um, let me quickly um, maybe elaborate a little bit on the implications of this result because I mean, now we have this error decomposition and now we can basically try to read off how strong we should penalize our problem. Um, and for this, um, we will now assume that we are able to optimize perfectly um, just, just to see what is the best we can do um, if, if things would be super nice. And then, um, I mean, we can make the ansatz that our penalization strength um, increases like a power law decay because I mean, it needs to increase because otherwise, the error is not going to decay. Um, and then basically this is what we're left with. So our error is can be, I mean, with V and star, we do you know the exact maxima, uh, minimizer, um, assuming that we have no optimization error. And that is what we're left with. Um, and we see again the 
the um, yeah the this trade-off um, and choosing the penalization. And now basically we can assume that we know approximation rates for our true solution of the PDE. And here we can make the assumption that the class of functions or, or these unsaid classes, that they approximate our solution U star like n to the minus r uh, if, me if measured in, in the H1 norm and like n to the minus s if we consider just the boundary terms in L2. And obviously, I mean, s can be chosen to be larger than r because, um, I mean, H1 embeds into L2. And then if we, you just like do all the accounting and see um, what comes out of this, um, you're going to see that, um, I mean, maybe I'm going to skip parts of this, this calculation. It's maybe not super important. It's just like, I mean, you just estimate the individual terms, but then you will get uh, that your error decays like n to the minus rho. And rho um, is given by this expression that depends on r, on like r and s that um, n sigma. So r is the approximation rate in H1. S is the approximation rate in L2 on the boundary, and sigma is basically the exponent um, that of our penalization strength. And then from this, we can uh, read off, like, I mean, sigma the penal that tells us the penalization strength is the thing we can choose. And then we can, I mean, just like do the counting, like where it's maximized, our like exponent that gives us the approximation rate um, and Actually, the, the 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 maximal exponent will be um, the minimum of s half and r, so at least it will be r half because s needs to be at least r. And what we've learned from this is um, because we need to penalize, um, we're maybe going to do worse than we could do with an, the approximation system. And Johannes, I mean, yes, uh, oh yeah, just a question. Uh, is it possible that uh, some uh, often in like in practice that the optimization error dominates over the other errors? Because even if you choose a large value lambda, lambda right, even though the energy error and the last error, right, even though they might be large, but the optimization mm -hmm. error will be larger than those, and therefore that will only show up really in the you know when you're actually doing computations. That can be the case. Um, I mean, I guess. I'm gonna I'm gonna point out two things. So back back then when we started thinking about this problem, um, I mean basically we fixed the approximate uh, the the penalization strength, and then or like mm -hmm. I talked to people, they said like I mean, they said lambda to five hundred, and the error doesn't go to zero, and then I was curious because I mean that could potentially say I mean if you just fix lambda, and sure you cannot like basically say that your error should go to zero, so we try to think about like what would happen, like what, what role lambda plays. The second part is that, um, I mean, this is a best case analysis, but even the best case analysis gives us something worse than the approximation rate. So I think it's still interesting. Uh -huh. And in the second half, you're gonna see that um, hopefully, I mean, I think we have, I mean, there are different approaches um, and these optimizers get more and more specialized. So that should just tell us like what the theoretical limits of this method are. Um, yeah, sure, if it sure. makes Thanks. sense for you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Sure. Yes. Um, and just two short remarks. Like, um, if you make stronger assumptions, um, then basically you're gonna recover stronger. Um, I mean, this this R half will will increase. Like, um, and. Uh, maybe the most important is the second remark that if we have an approximation rate um, of H10 functions um, of our of a class with exact zero boundary values, then our error decay, there's gonna be no trade-off basically, and our error decay is gonna yeah, um, be the same as the approximation rate. And if you just plug this in, like with, with standard neural network results for, for ReLU networks, then this is basically what you get, um, that 
again, our error, like if we, if we have here a neural network type function, our error to, to the true solution of the PDE, is gonna behave like the optimization error plus um, this term plus this term. And basically rho will be the exponent of our error decay or the best possible exponent. And that is bounded by this number. So these, these rates are achievable in theory but these rates, as I told you, for the reason that we, we studied before, will be slower than the approximation rate. Um, that So basically, this tells us the deep roots method recovers the true solution, but at a rate that depends on the penalization strength. And that is in general, like at least like from, from the theory, um, lower than the approximation rate. All right. Um, so far, so good for the deep roots method. Any questions to this part? All right. Um, then I'm quickly going to touch on on some of the things we've been um, interested in for pins, um, and then I can wrap up and pass over to Marius. Um, so here, as was already pointed out. If we work with our original formulation, basically with un like unsets functions that have exact zero boundary values, or if we penalize, um, it doesn't make too big of a difference in the sense that for both variational problems, for both problems like function space problems, um, the unique minimizer will be the true solution of the PDE. So we don't have like this term coming from 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 this penalty. And this makes it easier, but it doesn't mean that the same things are happening in these two approaches. And I'm just very quickly going to show you show you these results. Um, and like the first one is, and that has already been pro uh, proven by people like parts of this result. Um, I think the reference is on the next slide. Um, so if we want to estimate the um, yeah, error in the Sobolev norm, H1 half norm, between the um, neural network function and the solution of the PDE, we can do this basically by the square root of the norm of the or the, of the square root of the re, yeah residuals basically of our loss function. And um, I mean here basically we only have this or we have this slight um, sharpening that this is actually only true if s is at most one half um, and it cannot be true in general if s is larger than one half um, and basically this tells us that h2 approximation will imply h1 half recovery with the same rate um, and this is a quite nice bound i like it quite a bit in the sense that this is something you can evaluate during training um, this is different to the deep roots method where the optimization error appears and that you don't know. But this thing is something you can approximate by numerical integration. So this is available during training this bound and therefore um, it's quite nice. And yes, um, you can get stronger estimates if you put stronger norms than the L2 norm on as a boundary penalty. And you can also get stronger estimates um, just through interpolation um, but then the approximation or the error, this, these rates will decrease also. Um, and you can do this for any Sobolev norm between one half and two, but for two, your bound will be, it will be um, vacuous um, and not interesting. And I mean, just a proof, and um, yes, I hope this is the correct reference that George also mentioned before. Um, like for s up to one half, this is, um, I mean, just a pretty standard estimate um, from PE theory. Basically also the other direction that you cannot do it for s larger than one half goes by pretty standard arguments. Um, and then um, just um, in contrast to convince you that things or your guarantees are nicer if you have exact zero boundary values, it's basically just a, straightforward um, yeah, um, consequence of the H2 regularity of the problem. So, um, I mean, 
lot of problems. Uh, I mean, under very mild assumptions, they are H2 regular. And then um, we get the stronger estimate that we can estimate the neural network function or the error between the neural network function and the true solution of the PDE in H2 this time by um, the nor uh, square root of, of our loss function. And this is quite nice um, because this tells us that basically H2 convergence or H2 approximation will imply H2 recovery of, of this method in, if we have exact boundary values. And I mean, this is plain, I'm, I mean, pretty straightforward, the H2 regularity, but it tells us something interesting that if we, if we design a system with exact zero boundary values, we will get H2 recovery with this method and not only H1 half recovery. All right, so time for a quick wrap up. Um, I hope this is what you take away from this, that um, for the deep bridge method, the um, boundary or the penalization of the problem um, makes things a little bit more subtle and you lose something in your approximation rate. Um, and for pins, basically you lose regularity in the recovery you get if you penalize versus like designing something with exact boundary values. And what we can take away from this, and um, we're not the only people um, that have results in this direction. And I, I mean, like um, in, in our papers, we have a more thorough review and I have also here some references more if you're interested. Um, successful training implies conversions. So basically, um, what are we gonna do? We're gonna try to study the training process and design better optimizers for, for these methods. And this is something that Marius will actually talk about, um, which is a little bit more recent work that we're currently very excited about. Um, and yes, so this is a list of references um, and yes, that would be my part. And yes, feel free to ask any questions if they haven't been asked during the talk. Yeah, Johannes, I, I put, uh, there's a paper, uh, there are actually a couple of papers. The second paper I put there is the one that I mentioned from Stanford. And there's mm -hmm. another paper that uh, um, Ulusoy, I think you mentioned his uh, paper. I put another yeah. paper on it. But uh, I want to ask you, or probably it's in the next talk, but uh, uh, just like for the deep reach method where you um, you try to find uh, using the error estimates. You try to find the correct uh, weighting. Let's say, did you try mm -hmm. to do that here also for the for the pins? Because it, it seems if you split up the total loss into individual losses and uh, try to balance the losses, you can you can probably have a theoretical way to indicate what will be the right uh, loss. Let's say for the boundary. Uh, sorry, weight for the boundary. Yeah. Um, so far, I mean, I have, we have not done this. I think the situation is a little bit different for pins in the sense that, um, my guess would be, um, that things are more subtle in a way, um, because like for, for deep roots method, um, or let's say it for pins for any penalization, you will recover the true solution. And therefore, I suspect that the penalization strength plays a role mostly in the stiffness of and, and, and well postness of and the balancing of these two terms. So it will play a bigger role. Um, I mean, for deep roots method, it's clear that you have to send it to infinity, right? Right. And then the question arose really naturally how fast you want to do this. Um, and for, yeah, I, I would say for pins, the choice of the of the penalization strength lies more in what it means for the optimization and for the practical side. Um, and we have not done a thorough analysis of that actually. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that's very sure. interesting. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Johannes. Uh, yeah. We have questions for the speaker. Okay. So we'll move on to our next speaker and then uh, we can have joint questions for both of you. So our next speaker is Marius Jainhofer. He would be talking to us about energy natural gradient methods for pins. 
He completed his PhD from Patrick Donald's group at the University of Freiburg, Germany on mathematical modeling and analysis of bone growth. Since the spring of 2022, he is a postdoc in Kent Andre Madel's group at Simulia Research Laboratory in Oslo, Norway. He is working on scientific machine learning, and his research interests include error analysis of pins, deep Ritz method, and the design of solvers for this domain. With that, please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Can you hear me and see me? Yes. Yes, very good. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation and it's an honor to speak in your group. Um, as said, I'm gonna talk about optimize or an optimizer we designed for physics informed neural networks. Um, and this is joint work with Johannes Müller, who just, just talked. So it's in a sense, um, continuation of that talk or what we did after, after deriving the theoretical analysis. So before starting, um, just, just to talk in a nutshell or um, what happens if you solve these problems in, in practice. So you're starting with some kind of PDE that you want to solve. And um, you want to approximate the solution with the neural network. And then by some way or another, you try to find the parameters theta. And what, what you can often observe is, and I think we had the same or a similar picture in Johannes' presentation, is that the training process can be expensive. It um, often stagnates at a certain level. So this is the motivation for us to think about how, what could we do on the optimizer side. And this is the picture we will be ending with in a certain sense. And um, you see here, this is this is the approach I'm going to, to propose and explain. Um, energy natural gradient descent, we call it, and uh, I'll explain why. Um, in, and it, it performs well. It's fast in many cases, and it's accurate in many cases. So with that, um, Let's go to what I want to talk about. I will introduce a little bit of notation, um, but I guess you guys are really familiar with that. And then we we gonna approach the natural gradient side from really a finite element perspective and move over to the general case and then numerical results. And at any at any time, please interrupt me if something's unclear or if you if you have any questions. So just, just to set the notation for physics and formal neural networks, we had that already with Johannes. We, we are given a PDE. This is a stationary, stationary one. Um, it doesn't really matter. What we do, at least on the continuous side, is we formulate it as a least squares um, problem. We plug in a neural network. That's U theta. And... Um, that gives us a loss function that we want to minimize. Of course, discretizing the integrals, choosing weightings here, that is a that is a um, that is a difficult thing, and there are many many papers on that. Um, but let's stick with the with the simple version that I've that I've put here. And then that is what can happen. So these curves we produce them for a Poisson problem. With a rather simple simple solution, and um, and our conclusion was okay. Optimization can be a bottleneck, and this talk is going to be um, based on a recent um, paper that uh, we were very happy to got accepted at ICML this year. And um, just before we dive in some facts on, on how people, um, on, on, on what, I, what we've read that people at, approach these optimization problems. So you see Adam, the yeah, Adam optimizer often, sometimes people use um, quasi-Newton methods and um, you, would, you would have a certain optimization um, 
plateau that is difficult to get below, you can do it if you run it for the optimizer for a very long, very long time, or if you, if you choose um, very small step sizes. Um, but it's difficult. There are three um, recent exceptions that I'm aware of, at least. Um, one is the is greedy training, where you use greedy algorithms and train neuron by neuron um, by Siegel et al. Then there is a recent um, work that reformulates the squared pin problem as a saddle point problem and solves the saddle point problem. And then there's our approach. Um, we've learned about the two others while we were working um, on our on our um, on our recent work, um, and they're all quite um, different. And and the reason why um, training behaves the way it does. Is to me personally, at least to a certain extent, extent unclear. I would think there is definitely some ill conditioning, but do you run a local minima? Possibly sometimes. So, so these are with question marks. Um, and now, let, now let's get to to the method that we that we designed. Um, so to get some motivation, let's say we're in a standard setting that is also that you would also encounter for the analysis for finite element methods. Um, so we're giving a Hilbert space H and a right hand side F from the dual. And also a bilinear bounded and coercive form A on that Hilbert space. And now what we are trying to find is um, U star in the Hilbert space that minimizes this quadratic problem that we built from the forum. Um, and this is the standard setting for elliptic PDEs in weak form. But this is also um, what lies behind the pin formulation, at least from, from the continuous perspective. Um, so here I have a one term of a typical pin energy for, for a Poisson problem. And I, if I expand, then, then I find that this is actually quadratic. So this is no surprise. So what is happening if we're doing a Galerkin method? So we want to solve that minimization problem. We decide, now it's not neural networks, but we decide on some basis functions, phi i. Um, and we seek a minimizer of our, of our energy in um, the Galerkin subspace. So this is called M now for reasons that will become clear later. And we're looking for a solution U theta that is a linear combination of the basis functions. Now, in this case, we can discretize the energy. We can take it back to Euclidean space. It will be L of theta. That will be the loss function. And it's still it will still have a quadratic structure. And A is now a matrix that you can build from the form A and the basis functions you chose. And from the right-hand side, that guy was from the dual, so you evaluate it on the basis functions. Now, we want to get some intuition for what is happening in pins. Now, imagine you're running gradient descent on that problem, just gradient descent, nothing fancy. Then it's well known how um, how the objective function decreases if you do if you do a perfect line search, and um, the objection of the objective function decreases depending on the condition number of the matrix A, and if the condition number of A is large, your convergence will be slow. And in fact, it's well known that if you discretize um, discretize op PDE operators that the condition number can get big when your mesh size is small. So there, there is at least some evidence, evidence is the wrong word, there's some intuition that this might somewhat be true for pins. And, and actually there is a work um, where I think something similar was um, um, observed in, in practice when looking at the Hessian of the loss function. 
So, okay, what, what should we do about that? Now, what we propose is we should change the gradient. We should not follow Euclidean gradient. We should follow maybe the gradient induced by the energy inner product. So that is this inner product with the matrix A coming from the discretization of the form. So we're still in the Galerkin setting. And if we do compute that derivative, the computation is here, and denote the gradient it gives us with, with nabla A, and then, then we will find that, it's, that it looks like this. It's theta minus A inverse of the discretized right-hand side. Well, this is nothing, this is nothing but the error. If we're given a current current theta where we add in our optimization, this is nothing but the error. So one step with step size one takes us home. Um, so there is if we if we if we use that gradient, one step brings us to the minimizer. That's the minimizer in, in Galerkin space in the discretized in the discretized space. So how can we how can we use this or exploit this idea? In fact, there is there is a geometrical interpretation to 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 this um, computation I just showed you, and let me tell you what it is. So we start with the with the a gradient, and if we view that in function space, so in the Hilbert space, this is really nothing but the difference. This is our current iterate in, 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 in the solving process to, to um, the best we can do in Galerkin space. But this again, what you see here, this is nothing but the A orthogonal projection of the true error. So this guy is the true solution in function space. So we're projecting the true error onto Galerkin space. And in fact, this is nothing but the lurking orthogonality, which we know very well from finite element literature. And then a third thing, the last guy here, this is nothing but the A Reese representer of the Frechet derivative. Um, so we are at u theta, our current iterate. We can write down abstractly, or we can we can compute it at least as a member of the dual here, the derivative in many cases. And if we take that back to Hilbert space with A, we get back that. So there is there is something we can do if the ansatz space is not flat, and the ansatz space is not flat if you choose a neural network ansatz space. And what what you do is say you are at theta in the, the parameter and you have your corresponding function u theta in your in your ansatz in your curved ansatz so if we read these three steps backward we will end up with the following we should compute the a orthogonal projection of the a Reese representer of the Frechet derivative and we should project it on the tension space of um of our of our ansatz right and this this in, in fact is the key idea of the method that um, that we are proposing so this is this is nothing practical yet there is no formulas and no computation but this will be we will do this now make turn this into something computable and um marius can i ask a question uh you haven't talked yes. about the basis that you that you chose. The basis obviously would be important for efficiency, right? Definitely, most definitely. This is this is all for comparing flat to curved. Properties of the basis are absent in this presentation, but it's definitely important. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um so now I want to set up. Now I want to set up some notation. So in order to formulate our results later, I need I need I need a bit of notation and some ingredients. Let's start with the parametrization map. So we're giving we're given a parameter set theta, and there is some Hilbert space H. 
and the parameterization takes us from parameter space into Hilbert space. So for the example of a generic Galerkin method, this means theta, these are the numbers, this is the vector that determines your function. So these are the numbers you put in front of your basis functions. And P is a linear map. And for the second example, let's take shallow neural networks. We fix some activation function sigma, and then there is some notation, theta, how the parameters could be named. There are the weights, the biases, then there comes the activation function outside the affine map. That's just my naming here. Then this map P, this parameterization map, will take theta and map it to the function that is, um, that is u theta. So this is meant to be a function x mapped to this guy. Then there will be the energy and the loss in our, in our notation. So E, I say function space energy. And what I mean is just it's defined on the Hilbert space and it gives you back a real number is, is just um, the continuous formulation of something. And E, we can take it back, we can discretize it by the choice of a parameterization E. If we just say parameterize and then apply energy. So that's the subtle difference between E and L. L is the object that, will, that we will compute on because it's defined on Euclidean space and E is the continuous formulation. And to illustrate that for the Lurkin methods, E is the abstract thing involving the form A and the loss function L is the discretization of it where the matrix A enters. So in this, in this case, it's the case of the Lurkin method, um, the discretization still has the quadratic form of the continuous count part. And in the second example, if you choose neural networks as an answered space, really there is just, it's just in the notation, the difference. E looks like before and L, you see the theta here, but it, there is a catch. This L doesn't have quadratic structure in parameter, parameter space anymore. This L is a non-convex objective, as we all know. This comes from the parameterization of the neural networks. And, and then last slide on notation, I promise. There's the, what I call the manifold and the tension space. These are suggestive names. So we have a parameterization. And then what I call the manifold is really just the range of the parameterization viewed as a subset of the Hilbert space. And then the tangent space to that manifold at, U, at a given u theta, the fixed u theta, is nothing but the range of the derivative or the differential of, of the parameterization map. So silently here, I assume P to be differentiable. Um, so it's the span of the partial derivatives. And when I say manifold and when I say tangent space, then neither do I require M to be a manifold in the, in the strict sense, um, nor do I require P to be an immersion. So I don't ask, I don't ask for DP to be injective. This, means it doesn't need to be an immersion, it really can be non-injective. And hence, these will not be a basis in general. So if we, if we think back to the Galerkin method to get some intu intuition, then in a Galerkin method, tangent space and manifold, they are identified. So therefore, you don't talk about them in this case. Um, they're both same. Uh, Marius, a question here. Yes. Can, in your previous slide, so in, in a sense, when you do FEM, that you your 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 the span becomes basically what is the mass matrix, right? The product of the basis functions. Right? In the span here, these will be just the basis functions. Right. I can go. Okay. I can go back. This is a good yeah, observation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If if you take the derivative with respect to this guy, say theta j. It just gives you back this 
phi j guy. So in right. fact, right here you get back. Yeah. Did I and answer? That's what, you? Yeah, and that's what gives you the gram matrix, and that's why the you know in linear independence of those basis functions are important, right? In FEM yes. and um, other methods, because otherwise the condition number blows up, right? If it gets bad. I think the conditioning comes from from. Um, I'm not sure if it comes from the linear independence. Um, so if you're doing if you're, if you're doing a mass matrix like, but uh, mm. of course it comes from the operator, the plus in operator yeah. typically, right? Because yes. the null space and all that, the null space of that, right? Essentially, you must avoid. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, yeah, yeah. I just thought so. So you're trying to connect the Galerkian approach to this sort of uh, framework, right? Kind of, I can see the connection. It is for this. This is meant to be a motivation. Right. To understand to understand what is happening. Um, now we get into um, now we're really close to being able to write down the method. So we're giving we're given all all these ingredients I've showed you, um, the energy, and the parameterization and everything, and then we define a gray matrix, call it G E, and the I J component is defined by Inserting the partial, the i and the j's partial derivative um, of the parameterization into the second derivative of of the energy, and this is just the definition. And then, and this we would call the gray matrix. And now, the energy natural gradient is you start with the Euclidean gradient. So this is really what your automatic differentiation engine gives you back if 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 you differentiate with it and then the the energy natural gradient will be euclidean gradient preconditioned by the inverse of the ground like preconditioned i use this word what i mean is just apply the pseudo inverse or a pseudo inverse um, of the gray matrix to the euclidean gradient and this we call Napla E, the energy natural gradient. And to tie things back, if if we're using um, if we're using a Galerkin method, then then this is what 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 you learn when you first expose to finite elements. Um, the second derivative is the form A. The Gramian matrix is nothing but the system matrix. So if you think of a pure Laplacian, A will be the stiffness matrix. Um, this gradient typically doesn't play a role in standard factor elements, but this is the Euclidean gradient. And um, the energy natural gradient involves the inverse um, of A. So this is under the assumption that we chose a basis, then there is an inverse. But here in general, when we do not um, when we do not ask them to be um, to satisfy anything. We need to use the pseudo inverse here, and then we have one result on on what that method means. So there's some technical assumptions on P and E being smooth enough, and then we assume, assume that the second derivative of E is coercive, and then. We we can interpret what what, what this um, energy natural gradient means. So this is the energy natural gradient, and this means take the derivative of the parameterization. This is nothing but the push forward. So push forward of the energy natural gradient is a Newton update because second derivative inverse applied to the derivative. This is a Newton update, and then please project orthogonally onto tangent space. And orthogonally means with respect to the second derivative. And if you wanna, if you wanna link back to the intuition before, the Newton term corresponds to the A Rees representer on the motivational slide earlier. Um, so, so this is, this gives you an intuition on what, what, that, what that update direction does. It sort of corrects for the parameterization. It it goes. It tries to go in a geometrical way, right? This this is the best way, and then it projects the best in a certain sense. 
for quadratic problems it is. And then it projects on the tangent space and the admissible directions. And then, um, right, if, if we want to implement that, that's, that's how it goes. You, you would run a certain amount of iteration. You start somewhere in parameter space. You compute the Euclidean gradient using auto, auto diff. Then you assemble the Gramian matrix. You apply the pseudo inverse to the Euclidean gradient. This gives you the natural gradient. Then comes um, then comes line search, um, where you look where you look for an optimal eta. In zero one, this this comes from the motivation that one would be the best for a quadratic problem if you didn't need to do the projection, and and then then a then a gradient step. Um, in practice, um, we use the least square method to um, to compute this application here, and we we used, in fact, the logarithmic line search over the interval zero one. These are more technical things. And then just to mention it, there is literature on natural gradients. It was originally introduced in the 90s by Amari. Um, they're well known in the machine learning community, but with a different Riemannian metrics, which are not typically not PDE related. And I'd say implicitly, Natural gradients are well known in the PDE community, but um, and when I say that, I mean especially especially in the PDE constraint optimization community, where where maybe software would give you back a Euclidean gradient, and then um, then people stress, but you you should not forget to compute the correct risk representer of it. That is essentially natural gradients. What's happening there? But as ansatz places typically are flat, vector spaces, I mean, it goes unnoticed. And to the best of our knowledge, this energy natural gradient and energy natural gradient means that you use the second derivative of the energy to, um, to determine the metric. This is novel. There is um, one recent work by Nobekian and co-workers where they use Sobolev inner products for pins, but it makes a big difference if you use like a Sobolev just in a product that comes from a Sobolev space versus um, versus the second derivative. At least that's what we observed in the numerical experiments. So um, we are not the people to invent natural gradients, but to the best of our knowledge, the energy natural gradient approach is novel. And then I want to show you some numerical results. These are all very recent, and um, I'm very interested what you have to say to it. And there are some details here. I might um, gloss over them, and then if there are questions, we can go discuss it. So we start slow with a simple Poisson problem, 2D unit square, simple solution. Um, we do a pin formulation. We do no weighting whatsoever, just one half. OK, it's also a simple solution. Um, and then we discretize with random, with a fixed set of random points. We use a very small network um, with just 257 trainable parameters. Um, we can use bigger ones, but, but it wasn't necessary. So here, here are the results. Um, if we run, and the, the blue one is energy natural gradient, so the proposed method for this um, problem. If we run it in a few iterations, and in fact, also for this problem, just in a few seconds, we get um, we get high accuracy. And none of the other optimizers that we tried can match it. And in fact, it's several orders of magnitudes and more accurate. So we were, we were quite happy when we saw that. And um, still being, still staying with the same um, problem here, we visualize the update directions. So say theta means in initialization of your parameters. Say we are at u theta. This difference means this is the perfect direction. This is the error of this way you should go. 
um, visualized as a function. So here's energy natural gradient. We compute the push forward. It gives us back a function, and that's how it looks. And I'd say that's that's pretty convincing. And um, so the empirical observation matches the theory that says uh, the energy natural gradient should should give you this back in a quadratic problem. And then the gradient, the Euclidean gradient or vanilla gradient, I call call it here, um, is in a certain sense clueless. Can you can you give some details on how uh, what basis do you use? How did you compute the uh... The inverse here. The pseudo inverse was um, computed with a least squares approach, and under the hood, I think it's um, based on an SVD. Um, oh, but you three. introduce Oops. a base, right? So you introduce a base. The base is like just polynomials. But there is, um, I mean, okay, maybe that clarifies it. So there is there is no basis. It's just a neural network. This guy is say it's a shallow neural network, and then here you compute um, the partial derivative with respect to say um, the first weight, the first entry of the first weight matrix, and here J whatever that is, and and you do that for all um, for all the parameters. You go through all the parameters. So oh, you do that automatic differentiation. And this is done with automatic differentiation. Yes. How much? How much overhead you have? Excuse me. The overhead to do that overhead. How much? Oh, it 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 depends dramatically on the network size. So this this yields you a dense matrix. So when you scale up, you will have a lot of overhead. That, that's why you went with a shallow network. Can you do that for ten layers deep? For ten layers. No way. But we are currently investigating training sub like, parts of the network. So it is, so here it will, it, sorry for jumping around. So say you stay below a thousand parameters, and that's counting really all entries, then, then you're definitely fine with a laptop GPU. But if you want to scale up to 10 layers, you're going to get in trouble. And this method, I don't think it's going to scale to 10 layers just like this okay. yes Good yeah catch. so this just uh, the same way so you have always a full matrix right because it's the the base i mean are, yeah and, sparsity and then, sparsity of the matrix depends depends on the answers from your networks it will be a dense yeah. matrix if if the basis functions are locally supported it will be a sparse matrix but yes it will be yeah. a dense matrix and also you have to compute these integrals, right? You're computing actually the integrals, right? When the energy expression, when you take the second derivative, then you're doing- Yes, there, yeah, yes, so, there are integrals, so, yes. Right, yes. And those have to be computed That's... accurately, right? They are, so not so much. So when, when I say we're using 900 samples, meaning okay. I discretize this with 900 points within omega, then this means I also use 900 points for the discretization of the integrals there. Yeah, and these are this, this this is random, so I would okay. probably not call it very accurate. Oh, okay. Well, I, I figured you know, like in you know, like traditional Galilean methods, right, where you need to compute the energy accurately. So probably if you compute it more accurately, it might be better, right? It's so, efficient. So, so I think there's. It's not on my slide, unfortunately, but we, we did try that method for, for deep RITs as well. Uh -huh. So when you use a rational energy and a rational energy is not a null minimization problem. So pins, right. If this guy is zero, you're fine. Mm -hmm. But if you have a rational energy here, like Poisson, a Poisson, um, no, Dirichlet energy is the right word, sorry. Then, mm -hmm. We observe that you need to use a lot of integration points. Okay. Then accurate integration matters a lot. And by a factor of a hundred, I would say this is over the thumb. I'm not promising anything, but it matters a lot. Mm -hmm. But for pins, for pins, this seems to be rather okay. Mm -hmm. These are empirical observations. I, I have nothing to promise here or rigorous from my side. Um, 
right? Here are, I mean, you, you caught it already. All networks are small, medium size at best. And if I tell, if I tell computer vision people that I call that medium sized networks, they would laugh at me, but, but okay. But then it, it works really well. This is a five dimensional Poisson problem. And here we have computation times. And of course, this is, this is our implementation. This is not a perfect implementation, but it's still, it's, it's doing very good in a certain regime. And as I said, for large networks, we're investigating to train subsets of the network's parameters, because I don't think it'll be, it'll be scaling. Um, I have one more problem for you, a, a, a very simple inverse problem. So a so source recovery problem, you have a tracking type. Okay, you have a data function, UD. You wanna match that data function in L2, um, but subject to a PDE constraint and the PDE constraint is a Poisson equation. Um, you add that up, pin formulation is this guy here. Um, and okay, this, this, this doesn't matter. It's a simple, it's a simple manufactured solution here. You make two neural networks. Um, now they, they have of course two inputs because we're in two spatial dimensions, then two hidden layers with 64 and 32. And for the right hand side F that we're also looking for is a very small network because I know this is, this should be zero. Um, we don't use that many um, integration points. We're choosing them once randomly and then we keep them. We only choose 40 data points for, um, for the observation of data. But this is, this is a first implementation really. So we're currently experimenting with it. And, and that's what we get. Again, fast and accurate. Adam, Adam works too, but it takes much more iterations and, and also um, much more time in this case. Um, there is one sli last slide on, um, on higher dimensions um, where we try to scale a um, Poisson problem um, to see how, how far our um, how far our implementation would take us in terms of um, computational resources and also uh, to compute or to, to visualize a little bit to get a feeling for how important the number of collocation points are. And this is, okay, what, what do you see here? The pink line, that's, that's Adam. In uh, solid, you see L2 errors. In dash, you see the loss. So the two different things to, to visualize. And dashed versus solid, that's always um, dashed is loss and solid is errors. So, so you would expect the loss to be lower. And these two here, green and red, they are um, obtained via an energy natural gradient descent. And the difference is that we use more integration points for the red than we use for the green. There seems to be some influence, but this is this is preliminary, just um, just to show you what we are currently experimenting with. And with that, I'm at conclusions and outlook. Um, what we're currently working on is trying different equations trying um, challenging PDEs with challenging solutions. There it's, there it, the energy natural gradient currently needs more iterations. We're um, trying to, to battle test it in real world applications for investigating um, waste clearance in the human brain because we have really nice data on that here at Simula. And then for future goals, I put, um, about the fact that gray matrices are gray matrices are dense and they are ill-conditioned. And for large problems, we can't optimize over all parameters at once. So what is the what is the way to go here? Then there is no rigorous analysis of the energy natural gradient. 
there is this intuition or this one result that we have that explains the intuition behind it, that it's Newton plus a projection or tension space, but there is no, there is no analysis um, outside of that. And then I was wondering if there are applications outside the PDE domain. Um, that is just a question. So with that, um, yes, I, I thank you for your, for your attention. And uh, thank you again for the invitation. Thank you, um, Marcus. Or maybe I leave the slide open for, for questions, right? Uh, hi, Marius. Hi. Uh, thank you for the interesting presentation. This is Socrates from Brown. Uh, I have one or two questions regarding your results that you show in the paper. Yeah. Uh, is it possible to bring it up on the slides just so that I can... Which, which one are you interested in? Like the theory? Uh, the archive paper that... Uh, you should I bring the archive paper up or what you're suggesting? Yeah, yeah, because I was interested in some results that you have uh, in, the, in the archive paper. Yeah, right. Let me Google it. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. So don't, my don't, question is uh, regarding the stability of this optimizer. So if you go, you, you saw a lot of uh, tables where you basically point out the L2 errors. Yes. Uh, so you point out the here, for example, this the guy, median, yeah. the minimum, and the maximum. So we can see that the maximum error is quite high. Uh, and you chose to show the median instead of the average. So I suppose that somewhere within that blue region, if you go a bit, uh, a bit uh, yes, somewhere within that blue region, there are instances where we have uh, the the optimizer does not converge basically. So, so I can my tell question you is, it. yeah, okay, I, I can is tell it you stable. What How here. okay? So. Um, there, we did 10 initializations and nine of them converged nice. And one didn't converge within the computational budget of 500 iterations. That explains the maximum, but within a thousand iterations, it did converge. But um, so we the decided average... it, it is, so the, it, it can be unstable. Yes. Okay. Yeah, but it's Definitely. usually stable. I mean, the average would be, would be closer to the minimum rather than the maximum. That's my question. Yeah, I, so it depends on on which uh, metric you you wanna you wanna um, use for for deciding the quality. So um, that's up to for you. For the L two, yeah. yeah, just for the L two. Maybe yeah. maybe I can add something to that um, just very shortly. Um, so I wouldn't maybe say the method is unstable. But I would say it's very sensitive to your initialization and okay. how many iterations you need in order to basically come to that region where the loss drops very fast. That depends on your initialization. But like a single trajectory is not unstable, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. So so there are some instances within that blue region where it does not converge. That's basically yeah. yeah. My, or my, converges my only. You would you you can you can see that a little bit here. Often you would observe something like a plateau, where yeah, where you yeah. would where you would have really small um, step sizes. Yeah, that is also the reason why we do a logarithmic um, a logarithmic th search for for the step size. So it, nothing happens for a long time, and then suddenly suddenly you see something that reminds you of a of a Newton method quadratic convergence or yeah. or yeah. or even faster because these problems are quadratic so one step could be enough um okay this is this is just the honest uh honest answer here often yeah i just wanted to clarify it, because yeah, often it works really well but there are instances where, where where there is trouble okay okay i just wanted to clarify because usually in these graphs it's not uh, visible where it it does actually converge or not and that's why no, uh, sure. I, I totally, to I totally, check. I don't, I totally get your question. Thanks for answering, uh, asking. Okay. And uh, another question 
So you mentioned on the paper that you use double precision for the calculations. Yes. And, and that is important. Uh, yeah, that's actually my question. How could you reproduce these results with single precision? No. No. Because no. double precision we, usually you, yeah. we could we could go down to a certain um to a certain um margin and then and then um then we, we we visualize the push forwards during the training and if the push forward looks looks like it has a clue then then you know you're on the right trajectory but um it is really sensitive to um to the smallest singular value that you um that you allow in the least square solve but it i mean the double precision can be up to 30 times slower compared to the single. So that's also a factor uh, independent of the iterations. You also have that. It's, yes, definitely. Uh, it's basically a multiplier of the iterations in the end. It is, yeah. But um, so uh -huh. so um, if you want to get an intuition for that, a similar, you can reproduce a similar effect um, when you set, when you set the parameter, when you use an SVD-based solve, for least least squares, you you typically set a threshold on what the smallest singular value is in that solve. And if you play around with that, you can reproduce. You can, to a certain extent, reproduce um, this behavior between single and double precision. That's my right. that's my current in, intuition of that um, right. phenomenon. Uh, just one last question. Sorry, Sukumar. Uh, so you haven't tried any stiff problems yet. Uh... With no, methods. no, 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 we haven't. Okay, okay yeah. thank you. Sorry, I was just interested in the application, but it's very interesting. Uh, I mean, interesting I mean, ideas. if when you have questions, you can also just send me an email and um, sure. we can talk the two of us. Sure thing. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, just one like couple of questions, actually, Marius. So, what the yes. first is that I mean, given what uh, Johannes talked about earlier. So in this, if you had added exact boundary imposition, would things improve, or have you had any experience with that? Or yes, we 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 tried that, and um, things would improve. It would converge faster and easier. We would see less plateaus. So it it seems exact boundary values seem to make the problem easier. Also, a similar vein that yeah. Also, uh, in, have you tried other? Even for the Poisson problem, have you tried sort of more right hand side, which are localized or something, you know, which have a different flavor than just a sign function, where it's, it's a tougher solution to capture in general. But uh, yeah. you know, if the training is if the training is good, it should you know get get you there, right? Yeah, yeah. So so um, we are currently experimenting with faster oscillating functions, and we're having at a certain point we're having troubles here. Okay, and it it, it shows a plateauing. Um, I just chose a plateau, but um, I have no um, no real um, answer or intuition what what is going on there at the moment. No, because... Whether it's numerical, I I really yes we we're experimenting with it, but um, it's not yet it's not yet battle tested. No, because I asked because in in a problem which is which has localized solutions which is smooth yeah. otherwise. Uh, you would yeah. need more quadrat more integration points or more collocation points where the gradients are larger right i mean so you yes. can't just be using you can't be just you uh, using uniform sampling in such no. a problem i mean so, i mean yeah. we we've tried for example um this evolutionary um sampling because i mean you can you can discretize integrals differently every time you can adapt them according to the residual all, all is right. fine um yeah. But for the simple problems, I, it didn't seem to make a big difference. But OK, these are simple problems. Yeah. OK, thanks. Yeah, well, you're welcome. A couple of, couple of uh, comments or question. Can you do this uh, natural gradient if you have a non-smooth activation function like ReLU? That's a good question. I'm. The software can do it, but what it would mean <laughs> mathematically <laughs> um I, I I don't know. I don't want to speculate either, sorry. And 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 uh, and another um 
uh, comment maybe is you know the comparison with Adam is maybe perceived maybe a little bit unfair because Adam was developed in such a completely different setting for yeah. for setting where there's so many more parameters where uh, where there is actually a, you know um, you know you will sample a, a mini batch of data points things like that and and you are applying it in a case with just two hundred and fifty parameters to train so it's sort of different and with so few few parameters one could imagine just simply using Newton's method or yeah and and, and conjugate gradient there are many you know optimization algorithm that you know one one could imagine could do fairly well you know and, and maybe a combination of sort of preconditioning or something that could do quite well on on these low dimensional problems yes so so we did try it against um bfgs which maybe is not quite quite what you're saying but uh i do agree i do agree um, and it's certainly on the to-do list. And maybe, I mean, maybe we can add some, yeah, sorry, Marius. Yeah, I mean, we've went up to, I believe, 5,000 5, parameters. That's, I think, what, I, what, what we can train with the current implementation um, on, on the laptop GPU. And, and of course, we're looking for ways to, to scale it up. So, but 5,000 is obviously still small. Um, but yeah, you have your Johannes Müller, if you want to take over. Yeah, yeah, maybe just just a few thoughts on this. So um, I agree. I, I'm pretty sure that you could design other like Newton based methods, sort of. And these energy, I mean, since this energy natural gradient sort of tries to emulate a Newton method in the function space, it is connected to Newton method. And I think like in certain cases, there are very tight connections to to Gauss Newton methods. Um, and I mean, we see this, I mean, there are different views on, 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 or on natural gradients, but one way is that it is a very nice theoretically founded way to guess a good preconditioner. And that's sort of, I think, like the contribution that we guess a good preconditioner that works nice. Mm -hmm. Um, and we tested it against like something like pre-implemented, um, like BFGS. Um, but I'm sure you could come up with different preconditioners that should work, but it's one where you know, basically you're tr like what you do in parameter space leads to an approximate Newton update in the function space, which is a nice theoretical connection. And that's why we liked it. And that's why we thought we, we had to try it out. Um, and yeah, but I guess you can also design other methods that, that work well. Um, and then to the scaling up, I think, I mean, it's it's in general, that's always the problems with these sort of methods. And I guess like one natural way to go is like what people usually do is like use low rank approximations um, and try to do smart things um, with these preconditioners. And I mean, then you can scale them up further, but you're probably not gonna get to, you know, millions and billions of parameters. That's not gonna happen, but I think, you can go into like different territories of like maybe one order of magnitude more parameters, maybe a little bit more, who knows, but yeah. I have a, a, a comment uh, on the method. I, I like the idea a lot, uh, just that uh, um, I, I remember this paper from uh, Sandia where they did uh, gradient descent least squares. I don't know if you've seen that with the old. I know the paper. Yeah, I know the yeah. paper. So you could see there, for the, they can get really good numbers like yours 10 to the minus seven uh, for all linear problems. Uh, they abandon it because they cannot do anything better in uh, than the standard solvers in nonlinear for nonlinear problems. So did you try any nonlinear problem? We we did try um, a simple nonlinear problem and actually in a Debritz formulation where it was a Dirichlet energy and then uh, a third power of a lower order term and that did work well but extrapolating from that I I, I don't want to guess but it, it's on the it's on the to-do list to try nonlinear problems so you did take like k plus k u cube something like that right in the Laplace Laplacian plus KU cube. Yeah. Yes. Okay. 
Yeah, that's not trivial either. But uh, yeah, but uh, that did work. That did work well, very well. And k was a very big constant or a small constant. It was a, it was an e easy problem in the sense that it was a, I think it was a third or one something like that. Okay. okay. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much. This very great talk, great talks. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, everyone, uh, for the wonderful talks. And uh, uh, with that, we come to an end of our Crunch seminar today. <laughs> Uh, if there are no more questions, uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. And uh, I'll be uploading the video of the recording on our YouTube channel. Please feel free to have a look at it. And thank you. Have a great weekend ahead. Bye. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thanks, Marius. Thank Thanks.